and welcome to the Vine Life Podcast. I'm Tony Clark. I've got my wife here with me, Becky Clark. And I, I, today I've got a special guest on the program, and his name is Keith Thibodeau. Now, Keith is a husband, father, actor, author, executive director. He's a seasoned professional musician. He's also a Christ follower. He's probably mostly known for playing the part of Little, Little Ricky on the I Love Lucy show and also Opie's best friend, Johnny Paul Jason, on The Andy Griffith Show. Additionally, he's a longstanding member and drummer for the band David and the Giants. More recently, Keith became the executive director for Ballet Magnificat, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Now, this is an arts organization dedicated to presenting the good news of Jesus Christ to the whole world through the art of ballet. It was founded again in 1986 by Keith and his wife, Kathy. So, Keith, um, I can't tell you, it's an honor, man, for you to come on the program and, and join us today. Well, thank you, Tony and Becky, for having me. Thank you. It's a blessing. Absolutely. And it, absolutely. And, and Keith, I, I just want to, if you don't mind, I'll get into the, to the beginning. Uh, and, of course, that has to deal with the I Love Lucy show and the program <laughs> Now, your beginnings as an actor, you started very young. How did you get the stint or the acting um, role as Little Ricky on the I Love Lucy, Lucy show? How did that start? That's kind of an interesting story. I started out in Louisiana, far away from Hollywood, in a little southern South Louisiana town. Um, actually, I was born in Lafayette, but my parents lived in Bro Bridge, which is a crawfish capital of the world. Uh, better known as, and uh, it's a very, very Cajun uh, background, and um, but I started to play the drums at a very early age, uh, around two years old maybe, on a, a, a metal washboard in the backyard of the house, and, and some, maybe a couple of tin trash cans, and knives and forks, the whole, you know, pots and pans, whole story that kids can do as they want to play the drums and they don't have any drums so they play what they've got and the neighbor heard me uh, playing in the backyard one day and uh, told my mom and dad that she um, she really heard me playing rhythm so they needed to get me a like a, a set of drums so my dad got me a toy set that went to a you know, a, a real snare drum. And then from that point on, I began to uh, to get better and better. And I uh, got so good that I, I ended up playing like uh, high schools. And you know, I used, my dad used to take me to see parades and the parade drummers. You know, I used to listen to big band music on the radio back in the 50s. And uh, of course, that's what we had back then. But uh, a man named Horace Height came to town. And he had a big band in the 1950s and actually a television so show called uh, the Horse Height Swift Premium Hour, which was the uh, the meat company, Swift Meats. And uh, that was on Saturday nights. I think it was on the same night as the Out of Lucy show. So nevertheless, uh, after playing for Mr. Height in his, um, like, it was like a talent show, um, I went on to, uh, my dad went on to ask him if, if I had any future in show business. And my dad said, well, I mean, Mr. Hyde said, well, Mr. Thibodeau, I don't think so. You know, I th we've already got a young drummer, 12-year-old drummer. I don't know if we could use a three-and-a-half, four-year-old drummer on, on the set, you know, and all this. But, but two weeks later, uh, uh, Mr. Hyde called my dad and said, would you... Uh, consider coming as a regular you and your son and we'll pay you as well Mr. Thibodeau so you, he had to quit his job at United Gas Company which is where he was working and travel with me doing one night stands across the nation in Canada with this big band variety show which ended up in California and so to answer your question through a long story that's how it happened I went uh we we actually ended up at Mr. uh at Horace Heights Ranch, which was in the Sherman Oaks uh, area of California. And uh, a friend of my dad's found out about an interview that they were having at Desilu Studios for uh, the son of Lucia Ball and Desi Arnaz and their big hit show, I Love Lucy Show. So uh, I 
my dad took me to the set. Lucy was there. She was there in all her glory. And uh, she looked at me and she looked at my dad. And she said, well, he's cute, but, but what does he do? And my dad said, he, he plays the drums. And so she said, okay, well, go for, show, me, show me how he plays the drums. So there was a drum set there. And so I began to play drums and started banging on these drums and, and, and playing. And then uh, all the, the studio tech guys began to gather around and listen to what all the racket was about. The, um, the producer, the uh, famous uh, producer Sheldon Lender, who produced the, the Andy Griffith show. He produced Danny Thomas show, Joy Bishop show, shows like that on the lot. He, he came over as well and was checking me out. And then finally Desi Arnaz came over and started jamming with me on the drums and, and laughed and stood up and said, oh, well, I think we found little Ricky. So they, they, um, at that point they signed me to a uh, seven year contract with the studio. Wow, seven-year contract, and and how old were you again when you started? Uh, well, my first episode, I was like probably probably five years old. So it was, you know, with the shooting and getting ready, and because I wasn't really an actor, I was I was a drummer boy, and so my dad had to, you know, prompt me with lines and and help me, you know, say my lines and all that. So it it took some transitioning, but um, I looked. Very much like Desi at the time, Little Ricky. And um, so that was part of it. And then the fact that I played the drums, they could actually write more scripts and storylines around around me too as well. And them, me, me being incorporated in their skits and plays and other things that they did on the show. Uh, that's, that's such a part of the Isle of Lucy show, that, that musical, you know, club all that stuff. Lucy trying to get in the act every all the time. So that was all just sort of written in there because I could actually participate in that. And my lovely wife here, uh, Keith, has some questions because she's the I Love Lucy expert in our house. And I, I think you have some questions uh, okay. maybe about the Superman episode or something like that. What? Yeah, I do. I, I, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but I can I can be in a completely different room and hear the episode and know exactly what the next lines are what the actors are doing i mean i've i've got it um to, in my memory all of the shows so i'm so, certainly a huge fan of i love lucy and um it's just such an honor to be able to to chat with you and hear the experiences that you had with someone that i um just really admired um the whole staff the whole crew um i think your first episode though was what the one with um bob hope is that correct yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yes. And because um, I thought it was funny, um, I had, had listened to an interview that you'd done and about uh, mispronouncing Joe DiMaggio's name and how they, they played that with Ricky. Yes. Um, so did you meet Bob Hope at that time? Do you remember that as a five-year-old kid? Yeah. I mean, that was my first show. So my memories are, are a little a little more grayer. But um, but yeah, I, I, had, I took you know, press shots, photos with, with Bob and Lucy. And there's actually a, a, a shot with me and Bob Hope and Lucy that, uh, that they took, uh, publicity shots. And, and then of course being on the show with Bob too, you know, so it, it was, um, my first show. So, uh, it, it's, it's not, uh, I, I do remember, the Maggio part and the Joe Maggio and mispronouncing the, the, the name and uh, swinging the bat when I swung the bat and uh, and Fred saying, well, that a boy, you know, yeah. slugger, <laughs> yeah, yeah, slugger, you know. So, yeah, that was, that was that was my first episode, Bob Hope. And then um, I can't imagine as a five year old meeting Superman. Um, and I think. You must have been a real hit with your your peers, your five year old friends. Oh man! Um, knowing the hero, and then how did how did you separate the man from the myth? How did you how did you continue to like Superman, to believe in Superman? Um, I just think as a five year old, that would be something that would be so incredible yeah. to meet him. Yeah, and still know that. Um, 
and still know he's an actor. How did you separate that? Well, I mean, you said it. I mean, it was it was very, very hard for me as a kid because he was a a hero. I mean, I would watch those serials every, you know, like uh, every other little boy. I would jump off the roof, you know, with, with a cape on and all this, you know, my, my home and all this stuff. And, uh, and then when he finally uh, came to the show uh, and I got to meet him personally, it was like so amazing. I mean, it was so surreal. I, in, my, my, in my kid mind, when I shook hands with him, I thought he was really super. But in my, you know, acting mind, I, I knew that he was an actor and he was on the show. But uh, that's the thing about kids. I mean, you got such an imagination. You've got such a, uh, you know, fertile imagination that you can, uh, you can go in from imagination to reality very easily. But um, it, it was, uh, it was such a, such an honor for, uh, for, for him to be on the show. He genuinely liked kids. So I could, I could, you could tell that as a kid uh, and children that he generally liked his, his fans who were kids, you know, and he, right. you know, we took some publicity shots with him behind, behind, uh, you know, behind stage and all that stuff. And uh, it was, uh, it was such a, an amazing treat. And uh, I, I really emulated him and, and just wanted to be like him so much that my my dad, when when it came out of the newspapers that he was, uh, he he had he had died, um, yeah, you know, he didn't want to tell me the way he died. Um, he wanted to say that he he told me that he slipped on a bar of soap in the shower, and I said, and and that that kind of threw my brain in in a in a whirlpool of thinking because I was thinking. How can I was thinking to myself? How can Superman die of something so stupid? You know, you know, slipping on a bar of soap in a shower. But that's not what he died. You know, as you know, he uh, there was either a murder or a suicide or something like that. So right, right. Did you ask to have him at your birthday party, your real birthday party? Uh, no, I knew that was kind of like out of my pay pay grade right there. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I know that um, if I, because I teach school, so and if I had a five-year-old that came to me and said, guess who I met, Superman, I would think they were creating that in their mind and just completely making up the story. So what a what a memory that you have that that's, that's true. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, then I was, I was thinking about your, your story that you were telling earlier, your, your beginning. So you started in the, the talent show or the, the TV show, or is it an orchestra? Is that correct? You were actually in an orchestra, traveling orchestra. It's a traveling orchestra variety show. They had dancers, comedians, you know, music, of course the band, the big band. And they had, um, uh, you know, just, it was just like a variety show. And thing. again, as a three-year-old, what a treat to be able to to showcase your talent like that. But a lot of work expected of a three-year-old. That's correct. Yeah, uh, I remember flying, you know, to, to different dates, you know, and and stewardesses being kind to me and taking me up to the pilots, you know, and letting me see the the pilot area in, in the airplane, the cockpit, and uh, and just being. On the show, um, it was a little lonely because uh, I miss my mom. I was I'm the oldest of six kids, um, which were eventually to be six kids. Not at that time we had three, but uh, you know I, I remember writing a, a little note to my mom when, in Chicago, and I could see the sailboats on Lake Michigan and outside the hotel room, and I, I just remember just uh, drawing some sailboats and saying this is where I am, you know, and I miss you, mom, and and I really did miss you know my mom and that part of it. I was with my dad, and and we were doing these you know dates on every every big city. You know, we'd go to Canada, Toronto, and uh, other places, and uh, eventually ended up in California. And that's when we had a little bit of more roots at that point. And so, would you? Last question on the the I Love Lucy. Would you say you? You enjoyed the I Love Lucy 
era of your life or the orchestra era more? Well, I was so young with the orchestra area. I mean, all I knew, you know, with the Horace Hyde show was playing the drums. And I loved the drums. That was my whole life. And then once the Out of Lucy show came into the picture, it was this acting thing, too, with with the drums. I never really did uh, like acting. You know, I didn't I, I didn't naturally gravitate to that part of it. But that was part that that I was able to do. And and and, uh, and then eventually toward the end of the show, the Al Lucy show, uh, I really kind of began to embrace it. Uh, but at that point, Lucy and Desi were having marital difficulties and eventually d- divorced and separated. So that show ended. So that was my, um, you know, just just when things were going pretty nicely and the show was doing well, they were they weren't able to work with one another. So uh, I was out of a job at nine years old and uh, had to get on the unemployment line, and that's kind of the way that happened. And were you actually? Did you actually have to stand in an unemployment line and, at nine years old, or is that just... Uh... I, I hated that, too, Tony. I hated it. I hated it. It was probably uh, the most boring uh, thing that I didn't want to do. I mean, if I... I mean, it was, I, it was just a line at the unemployment line. It was a bunch of other adults stand, standing in line, and me and my mom collecting $55 a week for unemployment. So that, that's what it was, and I just hated going down there. I was just like, oh, I have to stand in this line and wait and wait and wait and wait and, and talk to this lady, and she's going give to give a check, and I won't see that check. <laughs> if, I, if my mom were to give me that $55 when I was nine years old, I might have, might have not minded staying in that line. But, but uh, we had, um, you know, like I said, I was the oldest of six kids, and um, we all, my parents all thought it was important to put us in uh, parochial schools, Catholic church, uh, schools. So we were all, you know, were, were uh, in Catholic schools, which, which cost a little bit more. And we weren't very rich. My dad worked at, at Desilu Studios, and, um, and, you know, his job was, um, he was assistant uh, at public relations uh, with the actor George Murphy, Way back when, I don't know if you remember this guy, George Murphy, an old Hollywood actor. But uh, he worked underneath him. So uh, that was the thing. It was, you know, I, I was out of a job. And then the Andy Griffith Show, um, I did an audition for the Andy Griffith Show. And they were looking for a, a little playmate for Ron and one of his friends. And so I got the role as Johnny Paul Jason on the Andy Griffith show playing Opie's best friend. And um, I was on about 12 or 13 episodes of the Andy Griffith show in that role. Um, and that was a blast to do. I, I loved playing with um, with Ron on the set and uh, just hanging out with him at the commissary, you know, sitting next to Dick Van Dyke and Mary Tyler Moore, eating a hamburger, you know, and just, throw, you know, playing catch, you know, it was it was a very nice transition, maybe, to sort of set me up to move back south, because that's where I was, I came from, the south, and this was a, a, a southern show. I think you've talked in, in the in past interviews about the set on the Andy Griffith show being different than the set on the I Love Lucy show. Uh, what do you what do you mean by that? It well. It, the way it was filmed was completely different because the Isle of Lucy show was filmed in front of a live audience. Uh, at least the Isle of Lucy show was the Lucy Desi comedy hour, which was after that was not, it was filmed more like a movie. So the Andy Griffith show was filmed with one camera, the Isle of Lucy show with three cameras simultaneously. And they edited it as we went. And, um, there was just, it was more like, a being in a, in a Broadway play with the Isle of Lucy show. It was like everybody, you had to do the show completely like it was. Uh, of course, you'd stop for breaks, but then you, 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 they would continue on. 
but that's the way it was. The Andy Griffith Show, you could shoot the end scene first, the, the, the beginning scene last, and it, it was just um, a whole different, more laid back for the Andy Griffith because there wasn't that audience energy and participation and you know you had to please the audience that were that were there so much and and uh so the the cast of the andy griffith griffith show you had some southerners on there correct and and you kind of related to them because you're from the south is that correct oh yeah yeah that was that was so, that was so i really really enjoyed the whole dynamic of the andy griffith show i mean just the southern old old school farm you know just just hanging out with Barney, I mean, uh, Don Knotts was hilarious. I mean, you could tell the genius that he was, you know, um, on the set. And uh, just being with that whole cast was like Andy was so laid back, but yet very in control. And um, the directors were were very talented individuals. The actors, of course, um, you know, were just tremendous players and and they all they all kind of had those uh, those roots evidently Don did and Andy and Francis who played uh, Aunt B had those southern roots so they it was, it was kind of something they were very familiar with I mean like like Andy with Mount Airy and which is where he was born but um, like uh, Ernest T Bass now he was a he was a very talented crazy funny guy who also uh, he he was from like the Brooklyn or something, but you would never know it from because he was such a talented actor. I mean, he looked like he was from the hills. I mean, literally, you would think that 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 there are people like that out there, you know. And he he just pulled that that part really good. I, I just really, I thought he was a funny guy. Any questions about the Andy Griffith Show? No, I um, I'm, it's just been an honor to talk to you. I could. I could probably sit down with someone like you and talk for hours about what really the people were really like, because you hear it from documentaries, you hear it from what you guess, but you lived it. So thank you for sharing those. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. Uh, um, anytime. <laughs> so Keith, I, so I, I've got to ask this question about, I, I'm a, I'm a sucker for, how old movies were shot in the locations and, and, and sets and scenery and things like that. Um, I, I've got to ask this question. I know a lot of when the shows were completed, a lot of the sets were torn down and they no longer exist. But did you have any memorabilia from any of the maybe the I Love Lucy set or the Andy Griffith show set that you still have or what? I really, or no? wish that, I really do wish I had more um, and I could have had more. Um, I do. I do have my original, uh, I said some drums from the set, uh, an actual drum set, a Gretsch set, which is a really cool uh, set that Lucy gave me. And uh, I do have that set here, and I had them restored in, in Atlanta. And uh, that's that's probably my biggest possession. Um, I got some Little Ricky dolls. I got some Little Ricky clothing that I had on the show. Uh, don't really have anything from the Andy Griffith show. That's unfortunate. Um, but I could have had more things from the Al Lucy show. It just, it's just back in, you know, my mom and dad weren't real big collectors or anything like that. And, um, as, as was most of the population, that's why they're, they're worth something now, you know, but actually, um, what I, I, I recently did a, uh, an event in New Jersey this past May, and it was this Chiller Theater. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but it's uh, they had uh, Priscilla Presley, they had uh, Mike Love of the Beach Boys, they had Richard Dreyfus, um, the actor, um, and this guy came to my booth. It's like an autograph show. Came to my booth and uh, he had a, a, a Superman costume. And the Superman costume was my costume, the exact wow. costume that I wore on the show, on the Superman episode. So he had me sign that. He had gotten it in an auction in Beverly Hills, he said. And uh, he had purchased it there. And so uh, that was amazing. So, Wow. 
That that's fascinating, and that and, is, yeah. So, um, Keith, uh, I I, I kind of want to transition from from your acting days to uh, your searching days, if you will. Uh, it's my understanding after your acting days were kind of uh, in the background, uh, you went into music and you were also searching for something greater. And you had some you were th those were, I think, the down years for you. You were searching and and struggling. Can you talk a little bit about that? And how did you find hope in your life? Yeah. Um, my dad and mom divorced and separated, which is the, kind of the, the catalyst for, for me actually going uh, in, in the wrong direction completely in my life. Uh, I was raised in a Catholic home, but I, my faith was not, uh, I wasn't born again. I was religious. You know, I went to Catholic school. I wanted to be a priest. I was an altar boy all those things. I knew that there was a God, but I, I just knew that he was not uh, happy with me, and I was really going to have to do some great things and not sin and never sin and never violate any of the Ten Commandments, or uh, I was going to go to hell. So the best thing I could probably hope for those in those days was purgatory, which is the Catholics believe that there's an in-between place, which the Bible, which I don't believe that. But anyway, my parents separated. That was the catalyst where I began to actually rebel uh, openly against the God that I thought I knew. And uh, we moved to Louisiana, uh, went, went to high school my junior year in Lafayette and my senior year there, and then graduated and went into uh, college there in Lafayette. Um, and began to, you know, all this during all this time I was playing in a in a high school band and then went on to uh get into marijuana and all the drugs that were so prevalent in the late 60s and my friends you know doing lsd and this and that and all these uppers downers you know all this stuff and um the band that i was in had a little regional uh record that we had out and it was a little hit and it was called Flash in the Pan. And uh, that's kind of how I felt that my life was, just a flash in the pan. And that it was just, you know, I didn't, there wasn't much substance to my life. And uh, coming from, um, you know, a broken up family, I, I, was, I was very ashamed of that um, back in those days. And, and it was just wasn't something that kids and, and you know, people... Um, you know, it was all about status and, you know, being cool and all that stuff. And so all that stuff said, um, I ended up uh, meeting um, uh, uh, the house band in Biloxi, Mississippi with my band, uh, Persian Market. Uh, David and the Giants were the house band. So David and the Giants were a secular rock band uh, before we were a Christian band. And um, I met them when I was 16 years old. Um, the manager of the club had me play drums as to audition my band to see if my band was going to be good enough. So if I could play with David and them, then they could bring my band into play. So I got up there and I was playing with David and David, David didn't want to do it because he saw this little guy who didn't look like he could play the drums. He didn't know who I was. So he said, okay, what do you want to play? I said, anything. He said, so he looked at the guys. He said, okay, well, we'll show this little guy what, what we do and 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 see if he can keep up with us so they played their hardest song that he said and, and of course i just played it and just and they just looked at me amazed like who is this little guy the the manager for the club told david that's little ricky he was little ricky on the Isle of lucy show and of course that started our friendship my friendship with david and and the band when i was 16 so um uh, my band played eventually, and then we moved, you know, we went back to uh, Louisiana and, and continued my life there with drugs and all this other stuff. And then David and them would finally come over and uh, and play, and I kept up with them through the years. So I got to, basically, I was basically running from the law in my own hometown, and uh, I'd hung out with a bunch of drug dealers, and so... The, the, the police were, were pretty hot on my trail. And so uh, David 
gave me a call one night. He saw me at a club playing and um, kind of revisited with me about, hey, we'd love to have you play drums with us. I was 19 at this time, and um, some time had passed. And so I just, I just took that as, wow, this is my escape from this place. So I left home for the first time, moved to Laurel, Mississippi, and joined David and the Giants. And, uh, of course, they were a bigger band. They were a regional rock band that had records out on Capitol and United Artists and Crazy Horse Records and um, was very well-known in that area. So uh, very popular. So that was my big break to being a big rock band and groupies and all this stuff. And uh, went into that whole sex, drugs, and rock and roll whole thing. I was just, you know, but but it just quickly faded away. And when I, when things began to, um, uh, when the reality started to to punch in, my best friend back in Louisiana, who had done the same drugs as I had done, LSD and mescaline and all these other crazy things, he basically ended up in a mental institution because of that and uh, lost his mind. He was a very talented bass player who was in my band, that, that high school band, and um, such a talented bass player and uh, musician, and he just completely just became a vegetable. And this really affected me. I began to be down. I began to get clinically depressed. I began to have suicidal thoughts as the band began to, um, uh, through the years of, of living in Laurel and... and um, just nothing really satisfied me. Not, nothing really filled the void. I, you know, I looked at Hollywood as something that was just, just something I wanted to just erase from my life because it, it had caused, you know, number one, my dad had an affair with a, a secretary at a studio in Hollywood. And so because of that, um, I felt like, well, maybe if I didn't, if I wasn't in Hollywood, my mom and dad wouldn't have, wouldn't have um, divorced, and I sort of blame myself for for all this stuff. And so it just it just began to to get just worse and worse to where I began to hear voices in my head telling me to throw myself out of my sports car going um, 120 miles an hour down the interstate. You know, just go ahead and run into this tree. Who cares? You know, uh, whatever. You know, and and you know, it, I I either would have ended up dead or in a mental institution myself, had it not been for God. I was laying in a waterbed in Laurel, Mississippi, and just in one of my deepest, darkest moments that I had, I, I remember telling the, the, the road manager that I, I felt like you know, I had thoughts of killing myself. And uh, he said, he told me I just needed to kind of pull myself up by my bootstrings. And, you know, it, it's almost like everybody couldn't understand what I was going through. It, it was just like nobody understands. Nobody understands me. They don't, they don't see the real me. They see this outside person who, I mean, obviously has, you know, got problems, but they don't really know the depth of the problems that I had. And so I, I ended up, on that waterbed, just laying there in, in, in my deepest, darkest despair, thinking about suicide and what, what was I going to do? And uh, I just cried out to God. I said, God, if you're real, I said, um, take me out of this mess that I made in my life. And if you do, I'll serve you. I'll serve you if, if you do that. I mean, I kind of made that statement, you know, and because I had I had tried all these things. I I dated witches. I dated. I got into the occult. I did all these. Uh, I read books on satanic things, trying to get supernatural power and control over people and ESP and all this stuff. And I just really I, I knew I was messed up and I knew that I needed a miracle. And so um after I said that and declared that to God, you know, if you're real, uh, you know, make save me out of this mess I made in my life. I was really down at the bottom of the of the pit, 
uh, in my life. My mom invited me to a meeting in Louisiana two weeks later. And um, it was a Catholic charismatic meeting. It was, a, it was Catholic. And there were priests and nuns there, and people were being filled with the Holy Spirit. People were being uh, healed of various diseases. I saw people raising their hands, and there was a guitar. Like, like, did you hear that thunder? <laughs> it's a little thunder, but it's cool. Well, it's, it's, it's just in time. It's just, just in time. time Your God story. Right. That's right. That's right. Um, so, I mean, there were people getting healed. There was an acoustic guitar. This this little couple were, you know, had long hair, and they were playing these little focus songs. This was 1974. And, um, and so uh, I just prayed one night, and somebody laid hands on me, and I ended up uh, basically falling into a vision or a trance, kind of like Peter, and you know, and that what he talks about. But I, I had a vision of Jesus, and I talk about it in, in, a, in a book I wrote uh, called Life After Lucy, which was published in 1994. Um, and um, we, um, my brother and I, who was 12 years old, he was on the floor with me. He, he was prayed for too, but he didn't see what I saw. I saw this light come to me and it was like out of the, out of the space, you know, outer space. And it just, it's like a star. And it just got closer and closer and closer. And, and in this light, in my spirit, I could tell it was a, there was a man in this wonderful light. And this man was Jesus of Nazareth, the one who died 2000 years ago. It was like, I didn't even know, you know, Jesus of Nazareth, you know, like that, that, that name, Jesus of Nazareth. And, uh, I could, you know, all these sins flooded my mind, the shame of my, my life and what I did. And I was adulterous and you know, all these different things, all these things came to my mind. And I said, Lord, I'm not, I'm not worthy to, to, to have you appear to me like this. And, um, there was just so much love, more love than the whole universe could contain in this light and more power than the whole universe could contain in this light. And um, I, I said, Lord, are, are you really this? Are you really like this? Like, in other words, like this wonderful, this, this, this amazing. And he said, um, he said three words. He said, yes, I am. And, and when I, when I could, was confessing my sins and all my problems, he, it's like it was imparted to me that, that he took all those sins when I was in this vision, and, and he imparted that knowledge that he took all these sins away and put them on the cross and felt each one of those sins and understood and had empathy toward me for those sins it was it was just crazy and i was thinking are you this wonderful and he said three words he said yes i am so i didn't know how profound those words were when he said i am because he says that in the old testament and he says that in the new testament before abraham was i am and uh it was just so powerful i came up out of that vision and i began to just understand the bible and the bible opened up to me like never before and uh because I couldn't read two lines without just not understanding anything that, that it had to say. And um, so I went back to the, uh, the band, David and the Giants, and I began to, to tell them about our, my experience and that I found Jesus and that Jesus was awesome and that we needed to change our music, we needed to change our style of music, and um, we needed to play more godly lyrics and, and sing more godly lyrics. You, we could play the same style. But just, we can still keep it rock, but just change the lyrics to, to more godly lyrics. And they thought, you know, I, I had some drug that I was on. And they said, well, you'll, you'll get okay in a couple, couple, couple weeks, Keith, you know. But I kept telling them about Jesus and telling them about Jesus. Finally, eventually, David began to have moments when he was questioning his life and 
I was able to speak into his life and to talk about Jesus. And and uh, and and then also Ray Ray and Clay in the band, they came to, to the Lord. And so in 1979, we became a Christian band, uh, David and the Giants, as as we're known today. Well, Jesus, uh, again, you, your your tr- your life was transformed by Jesus of Nazareth, the, the risen Christ, and it, that's such an amazing story. And then you transitioned over to you know your band changing from I guess secular rock to uh, rock that really has a little bit more deeper meaning to it. And I, I wanted to t- talk about that as well. David and the Giants, you guys really are are one of the I guess the the building blocks are one of the foundations of Christian rock, aren't you? you you've you got numerous hits. And and I've spent the last year kind of, I, I wasn't that familiar with contemporary rock or Christian music up until the past year. And I've started investigating and, and you guys are all over the place. You you guys are, your, your influence is all over the place um, in David and the Giants. Speak about that band, if you would, uh, and the influence that you guys have had over the years. Well, I mean, it was so organic the way we came to, you know, we, we, we're just raw. We're just raw rock musicians who, I mean, we weren't homeschooled. We weren't, we weren't in this, you know, cloistered environment. We weren't, you know, sheltered as that band. And all these guys who had, you know, lived the sex, drugs, and rock and roll thing, we, genuinely had an experience with the Lord and um, it just it just happened that I was playing uh, I got married in the meantime to my wife Kathy uh, in 1976 and uh, at that point I'd kind of you know separated myself from the band and uh, we went to California a while tried to it was oh, that's a whole other story and then came back and then when I came back, I began to play some jazz bands here and rhythm and blues bands and um, just around here in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, and David called and said, we're a Christian band now, and we'd love to have you play drums with us. And I, I said, uh, I just kind of didn't know whether it, for some reason, why, if they were genuine or not, you know, which... I, I just didn't know. I mean, and, and then I was just newly married, so I couldn't really make a decision like that. But as I kept playing in some of these clubs around town and witnessing to the guys in the band about my faith and and trying to uh, kind of live the secular life or, or play the secular drums and and witness, it, it was just not it was just not really working. And I just realized that here I am helping these people party and, and all these crazy songs that I'm playing, you know, just kind of like encouraging that. And so I called David. I said, David, I said, I, you know, hit me like a bolt of lightning today. I said, David, if, uh, if you haven't already got another drummer, I, I said, I'd be happy to join the band. Um, and he said, Keith, you won't believe this. We're about ready to get this drummer from Dallas. Uh, and we were going to bring him in. Uh, and if you hadn't called today, he would have been here. So uh, that started my David and the Giants time in 1979. Uh, it was December. And then my wife was pregnant. So we have one child, our daughter Tara. And uh, the first, right after she was born in April, the band. Uh, band went to England, uh, United Kingdom, and we played a series of, uh, of concerts in this little revival of this tent crusade in Oxford, England, and had a bunch of punk rockers come out, and they, they were attracted by the music. Once they heard the words, though, it was like all hell broke loose, and they <laughs> began to cuss and curse and say, oh, and they were going to throw rocks at the tent, and knock down microphones and threaten to burn the tent down and uh but they just kept coming we just kept doing it we knew we knew we felt like we were being like persecuted you know i felt like this is what it feels like you know to be persecuted for the lord and but they came back one night the leader of the gang gave his gave his heart to the lord he got filled with the holy spirit and uh 
and then other guys they saw that they they started getting they wanted to be baptized so we went down to the river thames with their motorcycles shine lights on the on the river and they got <laughs> baptized baptized them in the name of jesus christ like like the like the word says and um they had tears in their eyes when we left and, and you know we left uh, a couple weeks after a couple weeks of being there and uh we had a a recent phone call from the group that was there during that revival they had like this reunion and it was like these people were still serving the lord they were still on fire for jesus it was crazy so we uh, amazing we, yeah so anyway to answer your question we we uh david and the giants uh we we played a lot of pentecostal churches at first and then as the 80s came on uh we we uh we basically became more uh uh, we were able to play and be accepted by uh, some more mainstream churches as well, Baptist, you know, uh, other other type churches. Yeah. You guys have an extensive catalog of music, and you guys are still going. You haven't retired, right? Well, we we have limited engagements now, but we still do play. I mean, we have every one of us, David and Ray and Clay. We all have our different uh, things that we're doing, you know, and and different things that pull on us. But uh, David has his recording studio in St. Louis, and Ray and Clay live in Mississippi. They live about oh, about an hour and a half from where I live in Jackson. So um, we still get together. We're going to be playing at the uh, the Mayberry Fest in Mount Airy, North Carolina, and that's going to be in September. I think it's September twenty third at three o'clock in the afternoon at the Andy Griffith Playhouse, which we're looking forward to. Well, uh, Keith, I'll certainly put the link below the video and, and all of your other links. And um, because our time is limited, I, I really want to talk about your, your ministry with your wife. Sure. And it's called Ballet Magnificat. And, and I, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. But sure. this is an amazing ministry. I've been able to watch videos of what you guys do. And, and, and you're sharing the gospel through your art uh, can you speak a little bit about uh, what you and your wife have established in that ministry? Well, you know, Kathy, in the beginnings of David and the Giants, uh, she and my daughter would come on different tours with us, different churches. Uh, she would see how God, because she knew the band when we were the secular band uh, as well. That's how I met my wife, and that's a whole story in itself, how we met and how we got married, and that was a miracle. But... Uh, she uh, she was um, she was impressed with the fact that uh, God could use uh, that kind of thing for his for his work for the ministry, and so um, she was a ballet dancer, a very talented ballet dancer, who um, won the silver medal in 1982 in an international ballet competition, and she was Goodness. very. Um, very, very talented, very, very, um, uh, you know, she had a lot of accolades here in Jackson. When she quit the ballet here, she was part of the Mississippi Ballet, it hit the front page, you know, prima ballerina quits to start Christian Ballet Company. So we, we felt like it was the scriptural thing to do, to be able to have ballet and to dance unto the Lord in, in, a, in a modest uh, pure way, it, you get my drift. It's like this is professional, and um, it's an excellent. So we started that in 1986. My wife um, started in faith, and uh, Bellhaven College, which is a Christian university here, offered space for the studio and computer space back in 1986. We started out with about two or three dancers, one from California, one from New York. They came to Jackson, and because they had faith in Jesus, they said, "This is what I want to do. Let's. This is amazing. This is like a hurricane out here. It's like a, it's like a crazy, crazy weather out here." Sorry. I'm Actually, it's it's here too. We're we're getting it as well. But yeah. Well, that's the way weird that you're in Virginia and I'm in Mississippi. But yeah, um, yeah, it's, that's true. It's a big cloud. <laughs> wow. Anyway, let the rain come. Um, but. Eventually, you know, we, we started out in our van, 
We use our own stereo equipment, you know. It was such a small faith-based beginning, and we didn't know, nobody ever heard of that before, uh, to, to have dance for God. And, and so uh, it, it's just grown into a company, to a training program with about 80 trainees. Uh, we have a school of the arts. We, we teach, teach them from three-year-old to, to um, older. And uh, we actually began the same thing in Brazil, a mirror company, Ballet Magnificat Brazil, in Curitiba, Brazil. And uh, they have a company, a training program, and a school as well, too. So God has been so, so faithful to, uh, to Kathy uh, to be able to give her that platform and uh, to use her, you know, choreography. Our daughter's a choreographer. She's a dancer, too. So, uh, in fact, the company's doing a, a, a ballet called uh, Stratagem, which is all about the the enemy's tactics and strategy against Christians and how he does it. It's kind of inspired a little bit by the screw tape letters, C.S. Lewis uh, screw, screw tape letters. And uh, so they're, they're working on that right now, which we'll be doing in the new year, as well as uh, another ballet called Deliver Us, which is music from the Prince of Egypt, the DreamWorks movie. Uh, cartoon that is about Moses and the deliverance of the children of Israel.